how you uh, balance the working with the individual versus and what's the greater good with the team. Yeah, oh, really good question. Um, because it, once it is team first, you recognize every individual is a call to meet that team um, as effective as what they possibly can be. And you know, in measuring that effectiveness, um, uh, of course you want to win, but we've won games where I've been dissatisfied with our performance. And we've lost games where I've been exceptionally proud of our performance. So it's it's having um, an understanding of um, what makes those individuals tick, um, what they're good at, um, and probably having a thresh a threshold or a benchmark of okay, these are the this is the basic level uh, of which you can't drop below. Um, but identifying going back to look for what's good in people. So, what are your super and what are your strengths? Make them super strengths. And um, not everybody can move or kick like Dan Carter or Johnny Sexton. Do you you know uh, an Anton Dupont? You know the, these individuals are world class players. But I want our young nines looking at the very best um, in Dupont. But. You won't be able to do everything that he does, but you might actually be able to have another skill that's better than him. Make sure you're good at that. Get your basics right. Uh, make sure you're effective on the field. And it's blending those individuals. And in the same way that not every individual in team sport needs to be a leader, you identify your leaders and you collaborate with your players uh, to get to that point. Um, and some players just need to go out and do and play and, and you know, Piano players, piano pushers, it's the same in all walks of life, you know, and, uh, and you identify the people who want that responsibility and those who uh, who flourish with those leadership qualities uh, and maybe others who uh, it's too it's too too much of a load and it takes away from their performance. Um, yeah, it's, it, it is about understanding individuals, most definitely, uh, and uh, and bringing out their their, be their best personality and their best competitiveness. Yeah, sorry, we're a little rogue with the question. Yeah, it's nice. It's nice. Like definitely, that was that was yeah, tough. And I'm, you. while we're doing this, I'm gonna share one one story. Oh, one, just one, just one. This is your second one. <laughs> <laughs> you only three. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it counting. Everybody out. else. It's everybody else. Everybody always. They, when you watch a sports movie, one of the greatest one of the greatest parts of a sports movie is what when the when when the team is down, the coach gives that speech, the inspirational speech, and you get the goosebump moment. I had the pleasure when we went to New York for the finals, yeah. sitting in the locker room pregame, listen to listen to this man give his pregame speech, and the first one, well, the first thing he says was. Make sure all your cell phones are off. Now it's for me. The cell phones turned off, but the speech he gave, man. I mean, I've never been. I, I played sports growing up. I've had coaches talk, but I've never had such a, a, heard an inspirational message to the players and like the goosebump moment, man. It was just like being in there. I was like, oh man, like because not a lot of people get to see that. It's like they they hear about it and they see it in the movies, but nobody actually when you experience it, like. In in real life, God, man, it was like I was like because when Brian's like, you can go ahead and sit in there if you want. I'm like, oh, shit, heck yeah, that's take it out, dude. That's the hell yeah, I'll just sit in that and sit there just just to sit there. I was like, ah oh, man, I was like seeing the yellow players. They're they're just focused in on what he was saying, and it was like, man, and it, it, they got fired up and got to play, man. It was like it was a goosebump moment. It was like ah, it was such one of the, one of the coolest things I've ever, I've ever been a part of. It was awesome. Just like one must have been. Undercover because I didn't see you. You got to face up. You got to face up. Yes, I was. I was in the back. I was in the back. <laughs> Low key height. That's right. right. Now, now he's really gonna be looking for you. Right. <laughs> you you I'm just slumped out the corner now. <laughs> you must be dressed up. It's fun. No, keep going, man. Yeah. Who wants to go next? Looking back, looking back at all the players that you've coached. Um, a few must stick out in your mind as your favorites. Uh, what qualities 
made them stick out in your mind? Uh, great question. Great question. Um, character. Um, made me smile. Um, people like Tommy will when I first saw him. Um, and I'm going back, Johnny Sexton, mm. uh, when he was 19, 20 years of age. It looks the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> 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 it's actually in Chicago uh, where the Hounds play. Uh, I coached Darren and Dave there. We won the Churchill Cup against Argentina a number of years ago, obviously. Uh, there's quite a few of those boys come through, Keen Healy and the likes. But uh, uh, there's. Uh, you go back to the pilot in the front of the airplane. you got to be good. Um, and those guys were good at their job, uh, better than good. The burning qualities that they had, competitive and ambitious. They were always going to get the best out of themselves. Yeah. And you can see those individuals, they don't want to lose the tiddly ones. You know, they yeah. don't want to lose oh, the split. Yeah. Um, and probably, from, probably at a time, um, you know, they fall out with themselves when they do, but they learn to manage themselves better. But they've got that. Um, and you know, Rory Best, uh, who was and captain for Ireland. I saw the hours that he did and the extent he went to make sure that in the areas of the game that he needed to improve. You know, people don't see the work that you're doing behind the scenes. So it's not what you do in the training field here in Starfire or in the gym in Vigor. It's actually the work that you're doing away from, from the, the field uh, and how you look after yourself away from the field. That's what those players have. Um, you know, my own experiences, people didn't see half of the training that I did because I wanted to be the fittest. I wanted to be the strongest in my position. Um, I wanted to be the best out of myself. And I should never have made it. Look at the size of me. You know, and to play in the front row, I should, I should never have made it. But all I wanted to be was the best that I could possibly be. Um, and I have the good fortune of being coached really well by Ian McGeegan. Uh, at Northampton Saints, and he brought out the football ability in me, and through that, I got to play at the top. I mean, I watched you work out in New York. You definitely deserved enough for a while. Working out next to him, working out next to him, like, oh, man, you're picking up over here, coach <laughs> over here. Is, right? You look bad. Yeah. Circles yeah. around. Don't, don't tell the boys. The, <laughs> the, the boys give me loads of grief. I love my, tr I love my training. So it, it helps me be best version of myself. No, that was cool, man. Like, I, yeah. I went, I just went into the workout and they said, no, he came walking down. I'm like, sweet, like, this is, and then everybody else is out eating and hanging out. And I'm like, right on. Yeah, still, it's, it's still in there, you know. I used to regularly dream about, you know, the boys need you to play. And then, but it's become, you know, the older <laughs> I get, not, not these boys, but, you know, back in time. So I still see the game through the eyes of players. And, but I think it really helps you connect as a coach that you care oh, yeah. about your players. Because, yeah. you have, again, going back to being authentic and genuine, it's very easy to say, you matter, you care. Uh, but in those tough times, when you're you know, uh, having to tell someone that you're releasing them or letting them go, how do you go about that? Do you do, you do it you know, through a trade deal or do you actually speak to the individual? Pre my preference is always in person. Uh, if not, I'll always try and bring my player group first. I, I've watched you do it a couple times, and I'm just, I can't watch, because it's like watching training, right? You know, you're know, like, oh, I know he's giving him the news right now. This, mm -hmm. I'm going to walk, because I don't want my emotions to show or have any influence on the situation if somebody happens to glance over, because I'm like, I wear my emotions too often. Like, that, you're having that stern conversation, I'm like, oh. But that, that's <laughs> again, that's treating people with respect, and you, which you're really good. The same at. way, the same way you want. And I don't always get it right, but you know, I, I like to think I'm big enough to recognize when I don't get it right. And I've, I have apologized to people publicly in front of the squad and going, I shouldn't have spoken to you like that the other day. You know, I know. I remember saying something to Mike Shepard one day when I was here early, and the next day I said, you know, Mike, I shouldn't have spoken to you like that the other day. And that's not an easy thing to do as a coach. Some coaches yeah. might see it as a weakness. Um, I just saw it as the right thing to do um, because I, I I see my son sitting there as a, a, a rugby player or my daughter and her her 
her work life, and I wouldn't want someone speaking to them like that. I, I just want them to be so. Yeah, I, I just want, I would like to think that he, he's a good coach, a good human being. Uh, he treated us with respect. Didn't mean he was soft on us, but he got the balance right. And that's pretty much how I like to conduct myself. All right, so uh, as a player, who's your favorite coach? That yeah. coached you and why? Yeah, Ian McGeegan, um, Northampton Saints, St. Club at Samu, played for in England. Yeah. Um, yeah. Small world, really, when yeah. you think about <laughs> it. Um, and he, he was ahead of his time in terms of his collective understanding of the game, uh, as opposed to, um, you know, rugby can be like a, a complex jigsaw. Um, but you don't see the, the picture at the front of the box. You just see all this mound of pieces and you put a piece together and a piece together and suddenly oh, that's one section of the game. Uh, and then at 18, 19 years of age, having played rugby for nine years, you go, oh, that's what the game's about. Ian McGeegan made it very simple for me in terms of the, the, the collective understanding of the game. And through that, I was able to be a link player, even though I played in the forward unit uh, in the middle of the front row. Um, I was able to bring other uh, aspects of sports like soccer that I had played on racket sports to rugby union. Uh, those transferable skills probably uh, compensated for my, my size compared to other players uh, and got me selected further up the tree. A good career in the professional game. Yeah, Geach, uh, he coached, coached Novana Saints, coached Scotland. Coach the British and Irish Lions, he's a legend. So, is that, would, you say, would you say that's kind of where you, where you kind of model your coaching style after? Yeah, I think you know, like in all walks of life, uh, Nick, you, you you take bits and pieces, and cool. you still got to be yourself yeah. for authenticity. Yeah. Um, because I remember seeing Pierre Villapru coach once, and he's renowned, and I've told our player group, Ray, you know, he's. He's renowned for general de mouvement, uh, collective understanding of the game. So if you took away scrums and line outs and you looked at effective go forward in rugby union, it's where am I in relation to the ball? What must I do to be effective? Where must I move to to be effective with and without the ball, attack and defence? And he was a great uh, pioneer of coaching through that, through the game. And as a result of that, um, I just found, I, I, I've only been to watch him coach once, but he shared everything. There was nothing nothing hidden. And I was speaking to him afterwards and his message to me was this, you know, just because they see how Pierre Villepreux coaches doesn't mean they're going to coach like Pierre Villepreux because his understanding, coaching in the moment, not through uh, retrospective video screens or playbacks, but real coaching takes place in the moment. Be that entry at a scrum, you know, foot pattern in a line out, or uh, more uh, the life of the ball or your edge attack, that you're actually coaching in the moment and you're almost running and saying second ball playing here and correcting at the same time. And uh, McGeegan had that quality. Um, and, and real passion to connect with players, uh, whether you're close to the ball, you know, on the ball or far away from the ball. If you think of rugby like that, you know, am I on the ball, am I close to the ball, or am I far away from the ball? And you would talk about three families. Mm -hmm. In Villapru would talk about four families. And he was a French coach and a tremendous French uh, backline player, uh, a real advert for how I believe the game needs to be coached, so people love the game that I love. Right, mate. You boys are going to need to sleep after this. <laughs> yeah. like, I'm buzzing. No, no, I love it. Like, I, yeah, I don't want this to, is a, this I don't want to interrupt. By the way, this yeah. is me buzzing. <laughs> <laughs> Full on nerd out almost, right? Like, this is awesome. I love it. Uh, this is so much fun. I told That's you good. there was no oh, secrets. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, well, speaking of uh, speaking of kind of like uh, what we were talking about earlier, not not not, not the uh, not the balance part, but the um, about uh, growing the game in in North America. What does that look like?